on freedom of expression, but the process to ram this bill through Parliament is an assault on the foundation of parliamentary democracy. Undemocratic means have undemocratic ends. And in the end, what we have is a bill so flawed, so regressive, so illiberal, the government must cut off all debate. When I spoke uh, against the internet censorship bill at second reading, I highlighted how this bill is an offense against Canadian values. It's an attack on freedom. It's an attack on truth. And it's attack on multicultural heritage. Even before this bill was made worse in committee, it was an affront to freedom of expression. By removing the clause protecting social media, this government has made the violation so clear Every Canadian is now aware of the threat to, threat to their freedom. This bill offends Canadians' sense of honesty by perpetuating a fraud in claiming video delivered over the internet is the same as a video de delivered by broadcast. Internet video streaming has more in common with video rental stores, movie theaters, or bookstores than they do with broadcasters. Internet video streaming, theaters, bookstores sell a product to Canadians. Broadcasters turn Canadians into the product and sell them to advertisers. One business model sells a work of cultural expression to Canadians. The other business model uses works of cultural expression to sell Canadians to big business. Broadcasters sell Canadians to advertisers using publicly owned airwaves and regulated cable monopolies. The federal government has the authority under the Constitution to regulate broadcasters. Movie theaters, video rental stores, and bookstores fall under provincial jurisdiction, even if they're foreign-owned. The bill is unconstitutional even before it attacks the Charter. Canadians uh, are already fed up with Super Bowl commercials being substituted. How do you think they're going to like the idea of their favorite YouTube streaming video being substituted for some CRTC-approved Canadian video? They would never try this on with books or movies. Canadians are not forced to buy a Canadian book to read Game of Thrones. Uh, Canadians are not forced to watch a Marvel movie filmed in Vancouver to attend a, a, a foreign film festival. Phil. If the Liberals tried this with books or theatres, it'd be clear that this is wrong. But the problem with this bill is the violation to freedom was more subtle. At least it was until the government removed Section 4.1. That's when it stopped becoming a subtle attack to a freedom of expression, uh, to an attack on freedom ex of expression, and became a full-on assault. Now, the government will claim they have no interest in censoring Canadians' cat videos, but that's not the concern. The concern being expressed since removal of Section 4.1 is not that the CRTC will take down YouTube posts, it is that YouTube would take down or deprioritize videos in order to comply with regulations. The counter-argument that we should not worry about a cabinet putting th its thumbs on the CRTC scales because of the regulatory system takes a hit when you consider that Bill C-10 streamlines the process of cabinet giving directives to CRTC. Now, that's not to say the Prime Minister will go around ordering YouTube posts to be taken down, just that the limitations on what any future Cabinet can do to have reduced. Deleting Parliamentary Committee oversight of Cabinet directives to CRTC may not be Orwellian, but it's what an Orwellian-minded government would also do. And I do appreciate the attention being drawn to regulation because that's where the original threat to freedom of expression lies. Compliance with these regulations comes with a relatively fixed cost. For Netflix, that cost can be spread out over 7 million Canadian households, but for a smaller streamlining service, that cost may be spread over 700,000 households 
or 70,000 households, or 7,000. As the popularity of the type of expression decreases, the cost to receive it increases. The only cost to receive any broadcast expression is the cost of a receiving device, but streamers charge end users. The whole point of having their freedom is not to protect majority or popular expression, but the minority or unpopular expressions. This is not to say that web giants can't be regulated, but fundamentally, they're not broadcasters and cannot be regulated as such without impacting freedom of expression. Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, internet streaming services are more akin to movie theaters and bookstores, both of which are currently restricted under provincial registration. Is that closure a limitation of freedom of expression? Sure. Is that reasonable in a free and democratic society during a pandemic? Ultimately, that will be for the courts to decide, but at least there is a public purpose other than to grab some cash for the well-connected. The point is, movies, bookstores, and internet streamers can be regulated, but it has to be in the public interest and by the appropriate level of government. Just as we have regulations that say you can't build a bookstore made out of dry kindling, you cannot build a digital service which threatens to burn down democracy and not expect some public interest. Any opposition to C10 is being framed as opposition to Canadian culture or that opposition to C10 logically extends to opposition of the CanCon system. This only furthers the attempt to force a new digital world into an old analog paradigm. This also cuts off discussion on how to update the CanCon system to the digital world. The whole idea of needing a system to feature Canadian artists to Canadians comes from a time when we were culturally insecure, but we're not that country anymore. We're the most diverse country in the world. We import culture and we brag about it. We're a proud, confident country. We don't live next door to the United States on the internet. We live next door to everyone online. Canadians are amazing and our artists are awe-inspiring. At the end of the day, when you cut through government rhetoric of C10, it's not about protecting culture or online harms. It's about money and rent seeking. This government needs money and needs industry interest groups with euphemistic names to say nice things about them en français. Up until now, the cost of this rent seeking was largely borne by advertisers CRTC inflated cable bills. This government likes to claim it'll go on to fund artists, but it really ends up the money going to producers and their lobbyists. The difference now is that the cost will be paid by, not, by, not be paid by web giants, but by consumers. The method to collect the money are media fund levies, regulatory compliance costs, a new digital service tax, and HST on top of all of it. Together, this adds up to a massive regressive excise tax. There's an HST credit to offset the regressive nature of that tax, but there is no rebate for the DST or the CanCon media levy. Mr. Speaker, the government is not forcing web giants to pay. They're forcing the lowest income Canadians to pay and pay the most. It doesn't have to be this way. We can regulate online businesses in the interest of public safety. And we can do it without threatening freedom of expression. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? L'honorable député de Drummond. The honourable member for Drummond. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honestly, I don't know uh, where to start. I'm trying to uh, find what is relevant in this speech uh, and informative, and I really can't, unfortunately. And yet, uh, Bill C-10 
has uh, been debated for 